Hi, my name is Lee Cox. I am a father, I am a son, I am a brother, and I am a husband. I also wrote the book, Raised on Fear. This is my book, Raised on Fear. It is my journey through domestic violence. It's my story of being raised in a violent home and then becoming a violent person who hurt people. This has been my salvation. My freedom has come from writing this story, and I offer to share it with others in hopes that they too will find the freedom from their childhood. So I'd like you to join me while we travel back in time. The year, 1989, I'm 34 years old, my wife is six months pregnant. She's staying at a friend's house because we were not able to get along. I arrive at the friend's house, knock on the door, and explain to her that I just want to talk to her. She starts refusing to talk to me and I grab her by the hand and I start dragging her from the house. As I get about three quarters of the way across the yard, I lose my grip and she falls to the ground, screaming and crying. Her friend is standing in the doorway yelling that she's calling the police. That's me. 18 years ago, out of control, and a batterer. Now, my daughter's 14 months old. We've been in divorce court for almost two years, and my wife comes up to my home. We get into a fight. I grab the baby from her arms and I grab her by the wrist and drag her out of my apartment. As she's getting in her truck and I hand her the baby, she says, you're going to jail. I reach over, grab a handful of rocks and blast the front of her truck with rocks. She gets out of her truck, picks up a brick and pitches it through my front window. Next morning I woke up and I knew I may be in more trouble than I wanted to be in. So I called the city attorney and I said, do I have a problem? Am I in trouble? The city attorney said, when you drug your wife from your apartment last night, you fractured her wrist. And if she presses charges against you, you will be serving first the six months for the suspended sentence that you received two years ago and then we will be adding on more time for this offense. I knew I was in serious trouble then. I talked to the city attorney and she tells me I'm more than in serious trouble, that I'm gonna serve the six months for the domestic violence that I'd been convicted of two years before. And then I'll be serving the additional time for the new crime, the new incidents of domestic violence. Knowing I was in serious trouble, I contacted my wife's attorney and offered anything to avoid going to jail, absolutely anything. I agreed to seek counseling. I agreed to join a group for men who've been convicted of domestic violence. I offered money and I offered all my personal belongings. I then even went the next step and offered to give up the custody of my daughter. It did the trick. I started counseling. I attended the 17-week anger management program for men convicted of domestic violence. I gave her the money I had and I delivered my furnishings to her and I had limited visitations with my daughter. 
when I was five years old, I was in kindergarten, and I'd learned to write my name in cursive. I came home from kindergarten after practicing writing my name. And by the way, my first name and my father's are the same, R-O-N, Ron. I carefully went into the cupboard and got myself a piece of paper and a pen, and I went into the living room where my father was sitting. I sat down at the coffee table, and I carefully scripted my name out. When complete, I walked over to his chair and handed it to him. The look on his face was beyond shocking. The first words out of his mouth were, you little son of a bitch, look what you've done to my coffee table. I couldn't believe it as he drugged me over there and shoved my face against the marks on the table. And there I saw my name, his name, etched permanently in the piece of furniture that was more valuable than I was to him. While writing my book, there was only one person who ever came and visited me, and it was a 12-year-old neighborhood boy. And he would read what I had written. And when he got to the place where I was 12 years old, he looked at me quite seriously and said, I don't want to know anymore. This sounds too much like my life, and I don't want to know what happened. When I was 12 years old, I'd been off to Boy Scout camp, and got myself a bull whip, brought it home. Boy, I could really crack that whip. I brought it home, I showed it to my father, and he said, oh, well, thank you. This will be the new tool for implementing punishment around here. And for the next couple of years, I watched while my father would use that on bare butts to peel the skin off of my brothers, my sister, my mom, and my butt when we had done something to upset him. My father never took responsibility for any of his feelings and one of us was always held responsible for how he was feeling. I worked on my book continually. I found it to be a wonderful source to access all the memories, all the monsters, all my protectors, everything that currently is running in my life. So when things aren't working in my life, I know that it's someplace in my childhood that I'm reacting to. When I become overwhelmed, it's my childhood. I've spent 15 years working on my story, and there was one goal in mind, and that was to be free of all my violent ways of the overwhelming need to stop people from hurting me and from all the fear I felt in the world. From being scared, I never intended to really publish it or share it with other people because it's my story and it's very personal and it's very powerful for me it has taken me from the depths of hell to living a life that I never imagined was possible. So let's go to where I'm at today in my life. I'm married. I have an 18-year-old daughter. And I have a life that was unimaginable to me. And everything has come from going back into my childhood and finding the decisions, finding the promises that I made myself, each promise to never let anyone hurt me again, to never let anyone take advantage of me again, to never be punished when I'm really innocent. It's been a difficult journey. I've been married three times. 
my first wife, any time that I felt that she was smarter than I was, I had to put her in her place. And I wouldn't limit what I would do to do that. I'd start verbally and I'd escalate to physical control, violence, battery, grabbing her by the neck and throwing her across the room. Whatever it took to get her to stop being smarter than me. You wonder where that came from? I did. I was 18 years old. And I was dating the perfect girl. Mormon. We had plans to be married. Life couldn't have been any better. And one day I picked her up after school. And she said, you need to drop me where my dad works. I said, OK. She said, and then I got something to tell you, too. We arrive at her dad's work, and she sits in the car, and she looks at me and says, I can never see you again. And I was totally shocked. It was unbelievable. What do you mean you can never see me again? She said, my parents said that I can't be with a boy who is not going to college. Now, I made a decision in that moment because I was totally devastated. I didn't have anything to hang on to and nobody to talk to about it. But I made a decision. I will never date women who are smarter than me. And so my first wife, when I met her, I knew she was dumber than I was. Worked well until she got smart or until she started showing that she might be smarter until I felt stupid. My second wife, same thing all over again, except that I had settled for it, that, geez, I could just be stupid and be happy. And that didn't work. Actually, let me tell you about my second wife. When we met, there was magic in the air. I swear that my feet didn't touch the ground for at least the first week that I knew her. I knew that I had received a gift from God because I was finally worthy of being loved. Now, this was bliss because I slept like I'd never slept in my life. Can you imagine growing up sleeping with one eye open because you never know when somebody's going to grab you and drag you out of bed and drop you on the floor? Well, I slept for the first time in my life. I slept through the whole night and woke up feeling so safe and so refreshed. And it lasted five days before she got mad at me. And as soon as she got mad at me, I would freak out because that was worse than being smarter than me. That was meant I was a bad person and I needed to be punished and I'd do anything to avoid punishment. My third wife, I went for feel good and not be smarter than me. We were together 14 years before I told her. Every time she was smarter than me, I had to put her in her place. And it was fairly easy to do. But talk about an unsatisfying relationship. But until I got connected to my childhood, to all the events that happened, all the decisions I made, I wasn't able to even have access or I wasn't aware what I was doing. That I was protecting myself from being stupid. I was being rewarded. God had given me this angel to fix me reward me for being a good boy. None of it was true. So what started out as a two-month journey has taken 15 years. And I've now published it because I believe that other people will read my story. And when they do, they will find something of value for them and for their children.
last year, I had two granddaughters born. Now, I've already passed my violence on to my daughter, but my grandchildren, I will not allow them to grow up in a world of violence. And I'm committed to ending violence everywhere, and at first it starts with me, and making sure that my grandchildren don't get it passed on to them. I love sharing my story with teenage boys who are incarcerated. They're a captive audience and usually a little resistant. But as I talk about my journey through my childhood, I see some eyes light up. And by the end of my talk, I see hands going in the air and questions being asked that are serious and profound questions about how do I change my life? How do I make a difference for my daughter? These are 16 and 17 year old boys who have children of their own already and who have limited the choices that they have available to them. Some of the boys write me letters telling me how they are going to make a difference in their life. How they called their mother and she came down and spent a half a day with them telling them what it was like answering all the questions that they had about their childhood. Another group that I like to speak to is domestic violence groups. Women, men, I'm so moved when a father realizes that there's something more available in his relationship with his daughter or his son. When a mother realizes that she can protect her children from the violence that's going on in their home. When I was 17, one of my school teachers stood up and had me removed from my father's home. She's 80 something years old now and I sent her a copy of my book. When she received the book and read it, she wrote me a letter and she told me that one of her regrets in life was that she hadn't done something earlier that she knew my father was abusing all of us and did nothing. Only when faced with a beat up child sitting in her living room did she do something. And that that was one of her regrets. My own mother's regret is that she never did anything to protect us. After a talk recently, a mother brought her son up. They'd been two months out of the house and she had taken a stand to protect her son from any further violence. Those are the people I live for because she told me that hearing my talk encouraged her to continue her stand to protect her children. Will he ever change? Frankly, I don't know, but I can talk about myself. I have changed and I haven't changed. My need to protect myself still exists. And oftentimes it comes out as anger, even violence. Now I've been 17 years three months and two days without taking out physical force to control someone else. But does that rage still exist inside of me? Oh yes. Does the anger still live inside of me? Oh yes. Do I live in a world where I have to have agreements and support from my family to recognize that I'm starting to escalate my defenses 
which my defenses turn into violence? Absolutely. Is it something we can forget about? Never. I can tell you that if I ever hit my wife, we could never be together again. Violence is an escalation. It doesn't start with the hitting. It starts with disagreement, an argument, a conflict. And how do we resolve those in my family? Well, we resolve them a lot of times by taking a time out, going and getting some fresh air. But it takes everybody in the family working at this full time because I am wired for violence. That's the way I was raised. I'm hardwired for violence. And no matter how many programs, no matter how much work I do, I am hardwired for violence. That is my natural progression that I've been trained to do. And all the training in the world, when I feel threatened enough, my family has to support me in taking care of themselves and being responsible for themselves and realizing that I have a tendency to escalate. So we have a key word, and it's the F word. If I say the F word, everything ends. I know it, my wife knows it, my daughter knows it, everyone knows. That's a sign, dad's escalating. So that's where I stop now, but put in the right situation, right circumstances, I'll escalate until I realize because I'm not even consciously aware that I'm escalating. So you're asking, should I go back to him? Sure, why not? He's going to continue to be the way he is. He's going to continue to escalate his violence. And it'll start with name calling and it'll grow. And if you let it go far enough, you're gonna get whacked or your children are gonna get whacked. Do you think that you wanna traumatize your children with any violence? Returning to a violent situation is not going to change anything. For me, it took facing six months in jail and losing everything I owned for me to get that I needed to get some help, that I needed to take responsibility. And you know that it took one year of counseling before I took any ownership of my violence? You know, I listened to my therapist. She listened to me every day for a year. I would come in and I'd tell her the same story. I'm a victim. It wasn't my fault. I didn't mean to do it. And one day she said, you know, Lee, I get that you're a victim. And I said, thank God, somebody finally understands what's going on for me. And then she looked at me and she said, do you get that you're dangerous? And in that moment, my world fell apart. I got that I was dangerous. And that was truly the beginning of starting to own who I am. And that took a year, so you want to go back to him? I can't stop you, but I can tell you that the probable almost certain outcome is going to be that he is going to escalate, because I still do, and I've been working on it for 20 years. 17 years ago, I was a member of a men's group for men who had been convicted of domestic violence. Recently, I revisited that program, and while I saw that the technology and the education of the counselors had grown tremendously, I found that the men were really stuck 
and left with few choices in their lives about how they could respond. Anger, violence, defensiveness, and no admission of responsibility. I was surprised that society is still in such denial of domestic violence. My hope is to end the violence within myself, to come to a place of greater understanding of the purpose of being human for myself, and that that change will affect everyone in the world. It'll start with my own children, my grandchildren, my wife, my siblings, my own parents, and it'll spread out to those that I work with, those that I have fun with. It'll spread to my community that I will personally carry the torch of being violent free in our community and in my town and in my state and in my country and in my world. That's what I'll do. My dad hated liars, cheats, and thieves. And he was a liar, a cheat, and a thief. And I was always confused how I could be punished when I lied, when I knew that he did too. Growing up, my father was downright mean. He trained us the same way he taught our dog to obey. Tied him on a chain and kicked the crap out of him until the dog finally broke and cowered and did what it was told. That's the same way he raised us. My older brother, at 13 years of age, because of grades, failing grades in school, he was chained in the backyard for the summer. Fortunately, the police came by and told my father he couldn't do that. And my brother was released from the chain, but he continued to work in the backyard all summer. I talk about a hard life and the reasons why my father was the way he was. I don't really have all the answers of why he chose life to be the way he chose it. But he never once apologized. And when he died, he was alone. And it took five days before anybody even found his body. That's not how I want to go out of this world. I want to know that I made a difference and that those that I love and care about knew how much I love and care about them. Recently, I spoke to a youth group at a local church. At the end of my talk, the youth minister got up, went to the front of the church, and said, I've got something to say. I was an abused child, and I've never shared that with anyone in this congregation. Those are the days that I live for, when someone is touched, moved, and inspired to feel strong enough to share their own story with those that are closest and important to them in their life. The Eve Foundation stands for Ending Violence Everywhere. It is my way to share my personal journey of going from being a human-based animal who resolves his conflicts by having power and control over others to being a spiritual-based being who sees conflict as an opportunity and takes full responsibility for all my feelings, thoughts, and actions. Eve is committed to ending violence everywhere, and I am committed to sharing my story in hopes that it, one other person will see the possibility that they too can have a life free of violence.